Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here tonight during National Poetry Month for a poetry reading celebrating semiotics. I would like to begin tonight by acknowledging that the land on which our physical bookstore is located is the occupied territory of the Peoria, Potawatomi, Miami, and Sioux people. There are over 75,000 indigenous people of many nations living in Illinois, and we strive to recognize and honor Native histories, literature, and communities. We encourage everyone to learn more, and one place to start is by visiting native-land.ca. My name is Carly Nussbaum, and I work as the Outreach and Sales Liaison for Women and Children First, and we are one of the last remaining feminist bookstores in the United States, so thank you everyone for your ongoing support. Our physical bookstore is now open in a limited capacity, Woo. Um, but you can also always order a copy of the wonderful poetry you'll be hearing tonight um, at womenandchildrenfirst.com. There's also, of course, a convenient buy the book box at the bottom of your screen, it's in green, and that's the best way to support both the bookstore and the wonderful authors you'll, you'll hear from tonight. Events are a vital part of our store's mission. And if you're interested in learning more about our events each month, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter or check out our website. Coming up on April 14th, join us again for a virtual poetry reading with Douglas Kearney and Yona Harvey. So as a, a quick note, this event will be recorded and available to share at this link after the event is over. Um, and closed captioning will also be available via Women and Children First YouTube channel following the event. Now I have the privilege to introduce the poets who will be reading for us all tonight. I am so excited to virtually welcome Chikube Danladi. She's the author of Semiotics, selected by Evie Shockley as the winner of the 2019 Cave Canem Poetry Prize. And her chapbook, Take Me Back, was included in the New Generation African Poets in 2017. She will be joined tonight by Natalie Eilbert, the author of Indictus, which was the winner of Noemi Press's 2016 Poetry Prize, as well as the poetry collection, Swan Feast. Both of the authors will be reading tonight, followed by an author conversation. And we may have time for a Q&A at the end, so please feel free to drop any questions you have into the ask a question box also located below. Now, I'm really excited to hear from them both. So thank you so much, everybody, and enjoy. Um, OK, hi, y'all. Everyone can hear me, we're all good? Okay, I'm just gonna assume we're good. Um, I'm gonna read just, sorry, my cat, I'm gonna have to, I have to move him. He wants to be part of this, but he can't be. He doesn't understand poetry. Okay, uh, I am going to read some poems, one from my current book, Indictus, and the rest are going to be a uh, uh, from, from my new collection, which is tentatively called Overland. Um, so I'll just read one from Indictus and uh, just, I want to say uh, trigger warning because there is some sexual assault and, and power dynamic issues going on in, in this poem, as there will be in many of the poems I read, unfortunately. Okay, this is called Testament with Water Under the Bridge. They get to name the sons and I get a short cry before falling into line. I loosed my thighs by the river and scrubbed the oil slick fauna with my pubis as a cure. My fever is I'm starving. I've gone slack in the arms, spooned mud to begging lips and beat my tongue into absolution. I walked the rape trenches and came back many times to redeem the witch and my powerlessness clenched power to redeem her. My cervix buckled under the gate of its thick visions and I could do nothing but serve my kind more mud, more absolution. 
This is my chorus of refusal to know I am rent and crave the chasm that it makes. Yes, I exited the scene in a powerful gown, but when the sun sets, we fail each other. It is religious, my desire to find a better bridge, to be misguided by the promise of suspension. To meditate, I recall my soft inner cheek as it was pressed into my teeth by a silver hand. I don't know if I can be allowed a permanent ordinance. The earth drains the color from me as I give my Lord a better O face. My sex is a golden lampstand. I grip teeth around its poles, bleeding inventory until a journey winnows through. I anoint the jealous when I stand at the helm of invention, and I renew every snare to perform it again. My ejaculations leave me empty-handed in this way that daughters play the harlot with their gods. Karina dreams she must perform in a white van for assailants, construct a tabernacle against the wood of dominance, smile for the cameras to, seduce, to seduce her limbs into pillars and rings and curtains. Of course, when the congregation eyes me, I wiggle my hips until my calves announce my purpose. No wonder I slurp when they bring the spoon to my lips. I gave up priestly garments to be closer to the burning filigree. I singed my polyester tunic when uncertain with what to do with my community. Last night, a man handed me his letter of apology. I'm an opportunist for gifts, so I put the whole congregation in my mouth, and lo, my power is I have not once bitten down. Okay. I'm going to read a couple poems from Overland, which uh, considers uh, the, fa the failures of man in different ways. I've Indictus, while it's about a lot of different failures, fail failures is about the failure of man when it comes to my own body. This is about the failure of man when it comes to the planet. Okay, so this first poem is called The Limits of What We Can Do. Neutrality is a privilege. The rocks we throw ourselves onto are a privilege. It is hard to hate creation on the first day of warmth, but I am vigilant and a sack still fills up my mother and a sack fills up my father and a sack deflates my grandmother and I have no sense of sack. Tori Dent describes her slow dying as sham orgasms and I'm thinking of expansion, how I read HIV Mona Moore first in the sun on a day in May with my beach body and my coffee to stay. I know what I'm doing with this poem is a sham. The way I knew, I knew my vivacious privilege was a portrait of a bad institution. Capitalism fingered my throat with its delicious incentives to of eat. And I did eat because I had touched love and love knew what to do with me. I like poetry because there are no miracles in it. It is like the dream I had about disease, nestled, marked, curled as a burst blood vessel in the eyeball. That to own up to the mark was to look up inside your skull for others to see it. The poem is doomed and swimming in fluid. In my dream, I wrote an article for Slate called The Limits of What We Can Do in the Face of Annihilation, and it was received well. I wake up nestled, marked, curled like clickbait, a deep sea fishing net. 
I throw up yarn and go for a run. A love inside of me is breaking. This is called in situ adaptation. The teenager chants, I is how we win. But already I am thinking not about the 14 inch sea level rise in New York since 1900, not about topsoil erosion along Midwestern farmlands, not about the term rolling hill and how I run until I see black vertical weather, but about winter in another country by I, the word cologne rinsed over her mother's tongue. The chanting daisy chain and zip ties, the instructions to ball your fists when apprehended, not to escape, but for the small allowance of room in the hard lines of plastic clinched at the wrists. The zip ties cut skin and will deaden the waters forever, eventually. Every mass arrest, a future of waste to choke on. The teenagers chant the song of dissent and I clench and unclench the fantasy of a filled womb, the wet knot of never as I cool against a bank of America tower. And it's true, <clears throat> and it's true, I shouldn't say never, but it enters me like a filthy gulp of lake water as I sink 60 versions of me down. I don't stroke a jawline in a crowd. I is how, and so I stand alone, elevated. But I dizzy in image stations. The grass is like my historic willingness. The green that agrees to sludge and lilies, lead and benzines, beer spit and Whitman. My childhood, a carbon bray, I who opened her eyes to earth at 350 parts per million. Wind regimes disperse every species into cold land and hot land, and I was so close to each day picking eyelashes from his face on clean linens. This is what I tell myself, even here, at the end of it all. I stayed in the lake at the bottom of my loneliness. This one is called Earth The. Oh, problems. I've never been resilient anyway. The ropes eventually biodegrade around my wrists. Phosphor is a pretty, pretty word, even as it modifies runoff. When I tell academics we've entered a threshold without bugs, they laugh and say I should come to the South and say that. It is like the senator who brought a snowball to Congress. Together we walk into private conveniences. What we do is to spend it. I am not empty of metaphor. I am tired of multitudes, the indelible crush of leaves, grass upturned battle for the ball, gravel, gravel. Animals grow bigger at the end of their epoch. The wind soothes only when we need confirmation. Close your eyes to the breeze. I am not the promise of forgetting. I merged regretfully and I too missed the point. No tonnage, no respirators, no Edenic twist. Oh, chronic heavenless now, look. A scorch mark in California lumber resembles the tilted shape of Saturn. The pretty, pretty rings of disaster crashed moon cores. Why, I'm done with landscapes. Below this beauty, nothing lives. Disasters, my hands shake with its white vantage. 
Oh, problems, my plastic movable cunt. Disaster, a word loved by what comes after. And we without stars, our bodies alive, thickened. This one is called Mitigation, and it's a rendering of a crown sonnet, which is uh, 14 lines, and, uh, you know, there's a volta, there's a turn midway through. But what I did is I made it a challenge, so the poem is a very, these are very, like, they're like what I'm calling flash sonnets, so each sonnet is, like, uh, ranging from two to four syllables per line. Um, so you'll 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 get it. Maybe I don't know. I've never read it before. Mitigation. The eye guides us, speaks north. In wood, a lamb burned through. Hunger only a sequence outside us. My eyes found eyes and found more blue than I. Then I, a choking up of him, and I whited to north, a doing violence, latitudes shot through the trees. Confined here, a couch, no room, so uncompassed. Sewed a compass out of boredom to my breast, its skin, ducklinged with some blood. My eyes so white and healthy, my path no north, no east. I have pasts with no whites in my eyes. I lack hands, I lack nails. I lack nails to burrow us, a tree blazed in itched shape. The man carves his pretty verse, bark thick scrapes, a pitiful tree, a rope tethered. I came back to screen cut my memories, how he opened the window and pulled. Widowed a pulling, no. It wouldn't have worked. He halved himself up, folded at the sill. He is a centaur, half inside, half outside, his finger curling air. I heard nothing once. I hear nothing again. Kidnapping comes from English to nab or seize. I want to speak. The window screen was cut, the fingerprints still there. The fingerprints still there, but the parents gone. Weed grows over concrete. It's ideal, it is. This manner of taking, the soil that takes it back without blame the rows of violets, no room for metaphor without the bloodied tree. The white part of the eye is for guiding us through this. See only the eye. Uh, and then my last poem is a new poem. Uh, and it's called Psalm, and it's about a shitty man. Psalm. I have tried to love, litted like a cow, my deference to touch. There were long corridors, the edge rimmed with detergent, body muck the puddles I produced in love, the crown of no memory where the slick head of my daughter never pushed, 
the soft annihilation of her future collected in my stomach. I walk toward it, wreathed in a kind of headlessness. I baffled myself at what I've let in. A distant gull hovers above the asphalt, unaware it contains a future. I admire the blue of the lake. It is blue the way propane is blue, heating the flame hissed up from a spark. What I mean is I touch myself along a tendon that twitches my leg as some unnatural thing groans in darkness. The water only carries. I think of the lover now. I couldn't hear drowning in the lake. The wind, my mind in utter blue, my breasts bare in the sun. The rosé turning the world bisexual, a cry in the distance. My deference to touch, I have tried to love you. Uh, and then that's it. <laughs> I, and yeah, thanks for coming. And I'm really excited to read Chekube or hear her and read her. And, and read me. Thank you so much, <laughs> Natalie. Um, it's really cool to be able to share the space with you um, and to add it to the list of spaces that we've shared, I think. Um, and to share it with Women and Children First, which is such a, is essentially a staple in Chicago, in my mind anyway. Um, so this, this store has been a, a constant in my experience of the city. So it's nice that we're, we're with it together. Thank you for your poems. Um, otherwise, it's also good to be able to end this virtual e <laughs> book tour back, back here in Chicago since it's, it's where we are. Uh, and I'll just give a quick quick shout out to the, the couple of students from my Enhancing Lyrics seminar who are who came through tonight, even though y'all have to get up early tomorrow for class. <laughs> I appreciate that, I uh, appreciate y'all. I uh, appreciate y'all in the audience. It's, um, it's good to be here. Um, so I'm gonna read a few poems from Semiotics and then just one new thing. Um, this first poem is called Masqueraders and Marauders. A midnight summoning of our spiritual sickness. Blanch all. Gather the gleaming things we procure to distract. All the manner of birds losing coquetry when heavy rain beats open their red chests. The masquerader's headdress trampled underfoot a blasé crowd at John Canoe and New Yam Festival. Church tolls. This present assimilating missive, obscuring what little sky we could see, loosening the black wood shiplap from the moors, mooring mud cloth, gold, glass beads to a gravesite's bottom, their dead realms. We too are now want to terrorize children or women or other emotionally open. Yet pain to bear how our memory seeps. Threatened first with a cudgel, wielded now in our own fists. Trust how the decree is executed. Black equals nothing. On our very seams, we embroider their viral names. Um, ironically, Natalie, I also have a shitty man poem. Um, men are shitty often, <laughs> but I was shitty to him too, so. Um, this poem is called Tumbao. Our son this morning, inflicted in teams, sore, moving against, time or a pustule we may cure herbaceously. 
We ride its filtered light uncleanly, our physiques anointed by peeling down the pikeway. Your embers are manhood, obliged, encumbered to bad behavior. The labored way I've come to know your body, three seasons of guilt, to teach your eye the trick of humming, contact a commitment of pleasure, yours. If I let that hand against my back, you'll claim to know me empirically. Black goes against the optic, a roar of fluid, an appellation for vertebrae, slap core of my dissonance, the other hand at my black estrus, scented and tasted. I am a mean thing. We are not within love, but this want is what you love. Our morphology, a slackened thing. Come, scattered waist beads, warm air recouped. Light seeps past the gossamer curtains. I toss my titties like a pair of bongos, profuse timber of slap tone. Your cock a would-be proving ground for my girlhood, if I were a girl at all. What binds our genealogies? The distinction of the sheath versus the weapon within. The realm of our conjunction. One dead black woman long buried in Cienfuegos. She barbs me, begs the pitch for more unending gifts. She moves sliding side to side, coming to enjoy this torment of ancestry. Remind the origin of your mouth. Name me holy, vacuous, fertile, darkened soil the reclaiming spell called through your making. I'm known to her, her vengeful need met and how I cage you. That's a poem about a stupid man. <laughs> um, this is a poem about me. Um, it's called Against Representation. I refuse to thank the rich thieves who attempt to sell me my own image. I refuse the faltering archetype painted onto my playful trickster gods. I lament the value my nostalgia gifts, the Northern lovers who deserted me. So let run amok my untamed flames to claim the natural tormented status Low devil, a shell, mirror, truth seer, grateful for disbelonging if it commits me further to my freedom. Which passions resist commercial trade? I hunger for hot lust and great void, tedious lessons and infatuations, frenzies stoke the meek into action, endless leisure that leads to no production. Confession, though, not nearly enough. If not careful, words become empty renderings in shallow airs, dead revolutions at the podium. Many will clap, then return to the purchase line, but no insurrection can be bought nor can they be inglorious, nor can they be corporately sponsored, nor can they aim toward material bounties, only our urgency leading us to fruition. Let's abundance yield abundance, which only the fearful hoard. To abandon greed in service of, to loveliness, I must allow you in and feed you for my own well-being, barter obligation against loneliness. Let goodness yield more goodness. When woeful, I often check my bags for which treat was left behind. Um. 
Um, this next poem is called Ji Hao Shi, which loosely translates um, into English as um, to be pissed off. I was hammered the first night of Ramadan, guilty as if Allah believed it me, even if not. So many other outlets for discord, coitus, purple urkel, acupuncture, such practicality in things. I could have showered and had war sung out of me. My other name, Husina, pressed like a razor to my temple and I thought to lean into it, knowing for my people the many uses of the cow, milk, butter, meat. Against the tiles where I arrived, I shouted, Slaughter, are you looking to marry? Why else come home? Menine mutum, if not someone to praise name the plots my gut miscarried months earlier. I'll want that ache again, a hunger to walk the evening with. I was at my mother's ear while she killed anything. The cot's neck in her hand at 86's Eid. The flesh sacrifice mutual. So many pleasures guaranteed. So nothing beautiful ends here. Her largesse brought prone and me an oracle awaiting questions elsewhere. Afflicted to hurt nothing but myself. She too withstood love's accretion by holding fingers to flame, yet did make up her face that dusk, wearing her body like a sin only soothed by eating. Nono, Munshanu, Nama. Most of her is since covered, her kneeling pious, a soul belated in exchange for a scent and clean firmament. What is a man? One coming soon to hold night against her. Too early. It was that low blown wind, a worm up her skirt. Yet alone in the kitchen, she broke the fast anyway. Um, okay, I'm gonna read two more, one more from, from the book. Um, this poem is called Evening Holler. With the ease with which you widen the birth, my words like solo, sequester, risk being too understood. We watch the alley cats from the kitchen window over our end of day coffees. Afraid not just of stellar recall, but cognizance. It's why I'm sitting still, though I'm not tired yet. What do you see? This frame captures the kindest rendition. We play that secret game with strangers, lobbing off their heads and testing if they still know where to go. We trance something serene as the ambulance whirs down King Sussing. Imagining taking what isn't ours. A boy smiles up from the trolley, his mouth a vortex of potato chips. We come to no such satisfaction. Our bellies as empty as they'd been that morning. Except on your bedside table, there'd been a plate of cashews. How I'd wanted to put them in your mouth for you as you lay after I'd licked off the salt you let me rest all day as if I didn't pick the hard terrain. My eyes runny, callous when I stationed. Still, we make a space for another. Because in another world, that boy is our son. I love him enough. I stand in the doorway to call his name across the alley as the streetlights shudder on. You are the woman he'll call daddy when the city isn't so close. He'll sleep in our bed until he's eight, as if he can't soon slip away. In your hand, he'll drop a peach, in mine, the pit. 
safety becoming a word he'll know the man he'll know the meaning of. After his eyes close, we open ours within such grace, with silent gaze. We make a racket of our longing. We refuse the day to end. Um, and then I will read lastly um, this new poem, which is still a little bit of a mess, <laughs> but it's fine. <laughs> um, it's called Tranquility. In the downpour of this day's nicked throat, imperial blue red, blue red upon another useless waking. It's all mixed up now and the sky is pitch hollow. Only zombies roam the roads, donning a love for flesh, crack open their skins for pity. I'll have to live in it, monkey suit, at least some ordinary hours. The fifth week sober, sincere in dragging my poor will, brought along two rough black stones in my pocket, parched need, since every sense must now be so express. A bird's yellow voice, pillow soft concrete, at night, at least it was summer, no sick skin in sight, deep orange and blending right in, borderline intangible. A bomb sets off at the end of the street and the children break out in sweet laughter, their fathers too. Finally, happy men. My blood is pressing on me hard in the light show and exile is very romantic, isn't it? Tending a lifelong blues, chronically remaking the same expulsion, always holding arms up and out, always holding out. It really reminds me of the age of swift knuckles, eyes readied as blades, hard all day. Still can't shake the tired of it, that young rage. A bomb sets off right beneath my window. Bile green aftershocks. I want to confess everything. When it was winter, there had been the usual chronic runny white haze, wanting from such a short distance, only a cold hole to cringe at. Sometimes I imagined her cool breath to my air, carrying that sweet smell of cooking caramel. Ashamed to be so hungry for phantoms, quick smoke women, packing black plums, nothing settles it. Every turn of day to night has a grinding edge, too cautious a standoff. So far as I'm concerned, we've suffered enough of no more. Thank you. That's that's what I got. <laughs> so I think we are to have a conversation. Yes. Yes. I would love to talk with you. Um, I have so many questions. I don't know if we just we're just let's just talk. Let's let's, let's just talk. Have, let's just talk. A lot to talk about. Um, uh, I I mean, if folks in the audience have not read Semiotics, it's just it's gorgeous, and I you I've learned so much reading it about syntax, about about this this sense of exile, the sense of of being apart from both body and self and then being too close to body and self, like both at once are at loggerheads. And uh, it's an amazing book. Um, Chekou is a genius and that's all you need to know. But my, I mean, I'm always looking forward because, you know, I don't know. I look forward to things. 
I'd say plaintively. Um, <laughs> um, but I love that last poem and it feels like a continuation. So is that part of a longer poem? Uh, I'm sorry, a longer book idea? Is it like, do you have a sense yet of what it is going to be? Um, oh man, I mean, I, I think I wrote that poem by accident um, because I don't think I really know how to write. If I try to sit down and write a poem right now, I don't think I know how to do that anymore, which is probably incredibly asinine to say, even though I'm here to like celebrate this poetry collection. Um, but um, it was just like, a, it, it came from, uh, I guess the originating point of most poems, which is just like desperation to get this like thing out of you. And then I just, I don't know, I just started that draft relatively recently. You know, it really came out of, I don't, I think you were here for 4th of July, 2020 um, in Chicago, which is just like a nightmare for people with PTSD and like sound sensitivity. It was just horrible. There's just so many fireworks going off for this like bullshit holiday that I don't care about. Um, so I think it was probably that night that I was like, let me write this poem because I'm so upset by all these sounds around me. Um, but since then it has become, it has been growing into like a longer thing. It was just like some short lines and now it's like a longer thing, but yeah, it's just well, there. <laughs> well, your poems are so fixated on place. So it makes sense that like this fucked up sensory experience. Sorry, I don't know if we're not supposed to oh, curse. Oh, sorry. I, oh, I don't, sorry. I'm just gonna keep fucking cursing. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> oh, okay, we're fine, okay. But like, but your, your poems are so fixated on place and this fucking holiday does something, of course, to a lot of people who suffer PTSD. So I don't know, like, um, are, your poem, that, that poem reminded me, or, or, you know, I'm thinking of the ways that you use time and place, and there's a compression that always happens in your work. Um, to, like it, 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 there, I think it was this poem or it was the last poem. I think it was the last poem that you read that was about like this, like you know, future son that wasn't. And I also write about a future daughter that wasn't. And so there's this contradiction of, of future and present and past that I feel like poets are so good at toggling around. Um, I don't know if I'm asking, I'm not asking a question, I'm just observing. Yeah, commenting, yeah. It's that imagination I'm, thing, you know? Yeah, yeah <laughs> shocking, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, because poets are so, I mean, it's like, it's both the curse and the gift, right? Just that perpetual wondering, which sometimes actually gets in the way of anything happening. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that, yeah. that that poem is really actually about, you know, the, I want to ask my question next for you is about the shitty man poem, but, you know, thinking about the shitty man poems, that poem is actually about someone who is not shitty at all. It was a very tender, beautiful, queer person that I was secretly in love with for years, you know, <laughs> um, and like dreaming about what, what a future with that person could look like if I ever actually got around to saying, hey, let's have a future together, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it was, all, it, was, it was all rooted in possibility and never actually rooted in anything that actually happened, right? Oh no. Um, well, you know, there's like the cats, the alley cats was real and the coffee, nighttime yep. coffee was real. <laughs> but we yeah. did not have a child together. <laughs> you know? Not yet. Um, not yet. Well, probably not, not gonna happen. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think it's just thinking about that, like how, that uh, the imaginings, what's possible, right? What, what if when we extend control, what we can actually conjure up? Um, and yeah, well, I, I do want to ask you about the the man poem, but I also wanted to ask you about the um, the piece you read. I, I believe it was uh, the limits of what we can do. I think mm. is the title. Yeah, um, because you mentioned. There was a line in there about Tori Dent, and I love I love Tori. I love Tori Dent. She was so good, so good, so good. Those two books was just, uh, um, know. you know. So I was thinking about HIV, Mono Moore. Um, you know, so much about it's so much about a body that's made sick and and is mm -hmm. taking the time to try to recall the the experience. You know, 
Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit maybe about the, the influence of that text um, in relation to the piece that you read um, and just, yeah, yeah tor more Tori Dad fangirl. I I, yeah, I mean, this can just totally dive, like, dissolve into Tori Dan, um like fandom, that's fine. Those in the audience, Tori Dent is incredible. She was taken from the world uh, in the early aught uh, by AIDS. And she wrote throughout that experience. And HIV Mon Amour is this sort of um, sprawling text that is about her being in and out of treatment. And um, it's it's about disability, it's about, it's about what happens in the mind confronting death, what happens in the mind confronting being literally like quarantined, you know, cause that was an era in which people were so like AIDS was and is still stigmatized so severely that they just put her alone in a room. And um, my connection to that, to her in general is, um, her ability to write this long annihilating line while being in isolation. And I feel like that's a lot of trauma. It's it's this idea of just like, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about like taking up space, but for her, it was just like being loud and messy and fucked up because the world is loud and messy and fucked up. And it was this sort of in kind response to to a world that didn't want her or they didn't want to see her visibly sick in it um and i remember reading her um for the first time and it gave me these you know these huge permissions to write in this pouring way about my own experiences not with sickness but with trauma and um so that that's why I, you know i I've, i she was responsible in a lot of ways for um the 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 breadth of my lines and so i wanted to honor it in some way that poem in particular um my grandma was dying and she was in isolation quarantine she was like super sick and like i was thinking about this sort of generational deflation and how there are no um there's no control over how to fix someone or fix the world um so it's kind of nihilistic and cynical in a lot of ways but it's uh i i think it was coming up against um things happening simultaneously that, you know um you know i i wrote it in response to you know the fact that i I wasn't in, I'm a journalism ma uh, major. Oh my God, I'm like so young. I'm a major in journalism. Uh, no, I, I'm a graduate student in journalism, but at the time I was like, I was not a journalist uh, anything, but I was just reading articles and feeling steeped in this guilt and steeped in this feeling that I can't do a thing. Um, so I, it's an interesting, it, I was thinking about positionality and readership and like what that means. I don't exactly know, but I do know that for me, writing a poem is therapeutic, but as I say also in the poem, poetry doesn't offer any fucking miracles. Like it's not going to help in, in like a big way. Like it'll help like small ways and yet the world continues to be big and messy and horrible. So, uh, and yet at the same time, I'm like, I love poetry more than I love anything. So it's this really confusing space to feel that I exist in where I'm like, poetry is useful and you can't exactly use poetry to heal the the big traumas of the world like they, they, the poetry poetry isn't going to seem it shut and heal it it's going to be this much slower process but that again was a projection of my own cynicism it doesn't really answer a question I, I i think i said earlier um when when um we are in our little zoom green room that i'm always happy to answer questions but i don't have any answers right <laughs> 
<laughs> no, no, because I, you know, I think uh, nihilistic and cynical is very much in line with what Tori Dent is after, especially in that in HIV Monomore, where essentially she's like, I'm gonna die, so. <laughs> you know, she's kind of throws her hands up and then she throws her hands up and is like every lover I've ever had they're right is going to get <laughs> talked about. I'm just going to talk about people's bodies and she, talk about sex, talk about her, all her favorite like blackout drunk phases. She just oh god, she totally. just looks right into the void, I guess. She in looks one. right into the void and leaves no she leaves nobody to spare. Yeah. Um but like I guess that's like, you know, when I think about you know, your work is also just so sensual and like full of lovers. And at the same time, it's like, there's this gulf between the lover and the speaker, the speaker, not you at all, um, just the speaker. And it's this, it's this sort of asymptotal thing where the lover is here and you're there. And that's, I feel like that's a big theme in your work, right? It, it definitely is, um, which it took me a while to recognize that. And what you just said basically sounds like what took like, what I finally heard many friends and therapists eventually say, <laughs> where they're like, <laughs> essentially, there's these lovers, but you don't seem attached to any of them. So what's, what's that about, you know? Um, which I didn't, it really actually took me a long time to recognize um, what those tendencies were about. Um, and I now, identify myself as a, a fuck boy in recovery, <laughs> a femme fuck boy in recovery. Um, uh, yeah. well, I, well, I loved your intro to that fuck, your own fuck boy poem, which was like, I was also fucked up. Like, yeah. like it, it's like the, the like, uh, Sylvia Plath, uh, Ted Hughes situation, like they were fucked up to each other. I mean, Ted Hughes was more fucked up, I think, because I love Sylvia Plath, and maybe they were both fucked up. But it's the idea, you know, I like the idea that you're just admitting we were shitty to each other. I mean, it's it's uh, it's dishonest to say anything else. You yes. Know? Like, I don't know how to embellish myself to like look more, look better, how to make myself look better in, <laughs> in comparison to how I was actually behaving. Because mm -hmm. um, I don't regret any of it, even with that acknowledgement, there's there's absolutely no regret <laughs> attached right. to it. Um, so it's it's just a, you know something about the honesty of that confrontation is what I'm interested in. It's just be like this is I can't I'm not interested in trying to convince you otherwise that I'm like a kind lover. I try to be <laughs> these days, I guess. But yeah, but but poetry yeah. is really interesting because. Um, I feel like, I mean, at least for me, I'm, I'm, it's it's the opposite of a selfie. Like it's, it's right. I am not going to give this a pleasant filter. I am not going to give me a sense that I'm innocent or better. Like I'm sloppy and I'm doing horrendous things too. And I think like poetry, because of that, like it, it it's, it's a, it's a form that allows so many um, entanglements of honesty and and reality, right? Yeah. So good. Yeah. yeah, I'll have to, you know, and that's a past life now. <laughs> I think whatever comes out next, I'm trying to write like erotic nature poetry. It's Ooh. pretty much my jam right now. Oh yeah, especially right now. Have you seen yeah. these, these blooms? My God. Yeah, they're nice. They're nice. They're erotic just like, like, oh, we need it. Like we, we do. I mean, there's really lovely blooms. There, there, there's all the burbs. You know, so many burbs in trees. And I thought I saw a bat yesterday in, in the trees above my head, but it was just a bunch of sleeping sparrows. And I, I was like, you know, I felt this like sprung pastoral feeling, even though I'm in Chicago. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so accurate. <laughs> Every morning when I walk through the park and I look like I look at these these f little flower buds unfurling, I just I'm like, why am I aroused right now? <laughs> it's like so beautiful. <laughs> it's just so beautiful and lush, even in the city. You know, like we're in the thick of of all of that. I'm still <laughs> hearing like sirens and all of that, but it's so yeah. There's a lot of inspiration coming from urban nature. <laughs> yeah. 
And this cutie pie. Hi. And this cutie pie. This is Piggy. He he was like very excited to to learn that we were talking about nature. Um, he, he's a good, adorable too. I mean, so is this a good time to open things up to questions? Yeah, you, I, I was just kind of like waiting to see if one came in, but yeah, I don't no know any questions. Do you? You're always. I mean, maybe everyone is just spaced out, and um, <laughs> you know, they're like we're just a soundtrack to doom scrolling which is fine <laughs> that's fine <laughs> but yeah i mean well actually um i guess while people are thinking of questions um what i guess like yeah what's next for you what are you what what's what are you thinking what are your hopes and dreams <laughs> oh my god well without putting too many hexes on myself or saying it publicly i'm trying to finish this freaking novel yeah, I was gonna mention, I was like, that last poem was very redolent of your novel, and I was curious about yeah. there was intersections there. But yeah, tell me about your novel. Um, or it's, tell everyone else too, I guess. Yeah, and I'll ask you about yours too, um, or your other work. And yeah, I mean, it's a thing, it's happening. It, I've, I've hit the like four year mark and draft two mark where I'm like, okay, now it's not just a bad idea in my head, but it's like something I can actually push forward on. Um, so yeah, it's happening. I felt excited by the fact that a, a small piece of it appeared in the fall in like a port like a queer poetry and fiction portfolio. Yes. So I was like, okay, now that I like told people about it and people can go see a part of it, I guess I have to actually finish it, right? Uh, that's right. That's a good motivation. Um, yeah. So send out an excerpt and that might just be the whole novel. And then right. just like, you know, there's more. Well, what's, yeah. it, what's it about? It is about um, a group of queer people in uh, unnamed, possibly named West African city. Um, and it opens up in a party of them. It's about five of them and closes in that same party. But through the course of the novel, it uh, moves around from uh, across perspectives. So we see from, we hear about all of their lives from their immediate vantage points. Ooh, um, okay. Yeah, I, you know, kind of tossing a little ensemble novel. Yeah, <laughs> um, I love the ensemble novel. Uh, I think of it as like a black, queer, global south sex in the city. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. I think yeah. Um, for sure. And it's yeah. Yeah, way, if you've ever rewatched any sex in the city, it's horrible. It's just like not a good show. It doesn't mean. Um, yeah, so we need we need a reboot that is interesting and intellectually rigorous and, and super and, lyrical. It's basically a long poem. I was just trying to write like a really long, a, a two hundred and fifty page poem. So yeah. fingers crossed. It's been fun to do, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see about that's that's that's, that's next my main the horizon. Thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? I I, I, I think I caught a title of Overland. Is Overland. That, is that your title? It's the title for my new book of poems that is done, but I'm not, um, I haven't done anything with it since I said it was done to myself. Um, so we'll see what happens. I don't know, I haven't, it's done in the sense that I have written it, I've been writing it since we were um, in Wisconsin, I mean, you came after me, but I, I've been writing it since 2016. So it's, it's, it's getting there. Yeah. It's, it, there's a lot of poems that have been thrown in there, but it's, uh, the idea is that the, the poems are about, and this, the, the limits of what we can do does do a good job, I guess, of encapsulating the anxiety of knowing and witnessing this like feeling of omega-ness that's upon us, you know, this feeling that we're on the brink of something that we can't change. So that irrevocable disaster that's like always on our minds that is made, made more unbearable by things like pandemics and things like natural disasters, that's just gonna keep happening. So I just, I wanted to write about it and I'm getting a, a master's of science in science writing right now to further understand it. So like, uh, I, 
unfortunately, it's not looking good. And so I'm just writing about that feeling of bearing witness to something that is so uh, potentially inevitable because humans are extremely greedy and monomaniacal about the present. You know, um, it's like the money right now versus the generations ahead. So. Yeah, and overland, the term itself comes from this idea of like um, shifting wind patterns that happen as a result of climate change, like different jet streams. So like literally the kinds of ways that growth, occur the kinds of growth patterns that we've seen since time immemorial are changing because of jet streams. So the, the land is, changing in kind. So the kinds of pollens that we experienced um, are going to be in different parts of the of the landscape and that's going to affect ecosystems. So anyway, it's not great, but it's like, I'm still like alive and horny and weird. So what does that <laughs> mean? I don't know. Um, and this is Musi. Hi Musi. She's horrified. So cute. Oh, she's yeah, she's the skittish one. Aww. She's skittish. She's skittish and four pounds. I don't know. Um, Baby. Yeah. Um, do, uh, do we have? I don't know. It, it, uh, yeah, I think we. I think we're out of time. I'm looking <laughs> at the time and thinking we're out of time. Eight of two. We had a yeah. we had a very pleasant conversation though. Yeah, it was great. So we had <laughs> questions because we answered every one of them. <laughs> we did. It was beautiful. <laughs> Um, I just want to thank you both so much for your words tonight and for your books, of course. Everybody needs to find these and read them um, if you haven't already. Um, and just as a side note, we're so grateful to have been able to host this conversation in celebration of semiotics. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, as a reminder, this will live at this link. So once it's done, a recording will be here, but it'll also be on YouTube where there will be those closed captions. So thank you all again. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kylie. Thank Thanks you. So uh, thank you, Derek. Thank yes, Derek. I also want to hear a Musi poem at some point. I, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I will write one. She's just a, a pot of inspiration. So we'll see. Thanks. Have a good night. Bye. Good night, everybody.